Um, I'm Logan McClendon. I'm one of the field secretaries at Phi Gamma Delta, and I'd just like to introduce uh, Rick Youngman, or Rich Young, Youngman, sorry, <laughs> um, a representative from Holmes Murphy, uh, who will be leading a discussion on the biggest liability and exposure risks our house corporations see and how we can reduce the risk associated with those claims. Um, if you guys uh, have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to just kind of drop in the chat and we can try and address those later. Uh, thank you guys so much. We'll have about 45 minutes for this and then we'll have a quick break before we go out to the second breakout session. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Logan, for the introduction. And, um, you know, uh, first, thank you guys uh, and ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your for your uh, service to the uh, to the various house corporations across the country and your willingness to volunteer. Um, and, uh, you know, most importantly, for your time and attention uh, today, I don't think there's going to be anything that, uh, you know, I will probably address that, you uh, you haven't already heard, maybe, maybe a you know a point or two, or or kind of maybe surprise you with some statistics around you know what we know from uh, fraternity claims. Uh, you know what I've um, what we've done is uh, we're we've sent a, a document. You guys may have seen it in the past. It's called an insurance and claim manual, and uh, Dio or Logan will be sharing that with you if you've not already received it. It basically is. Uh, a nine, 10 page document that's a pretty lay person's uh, explanation of what insurance policies that the fraternity has in place for both the chapters and the house corporations and alumni advisory boards if there are uh, separate, uh, uh, separate ones of those from, from the alumni association. So I'm not going to dwell on insurance. Certainly we're gonna have Q and A at the end if there's specific questions around insurance. Uh, you know, I'd be happy to address those at that time. I mean, we always look at the insurance contracts as really being our backstop, um, you know, in our risk management program. Um, and what we really want to focus on today is really talking about, um, you know, prevention and mitigation, you know, so when and where we can prevent claims, you know, we want to take steps to do that. And when we do have claims, you know, what steps can we do to mitigate the impact uh, that they might have? Um, on your house corporation. So um, I will uh, start now by sharing my screen. Bear with me. Or maybe. There we go. Um, and I'm going to start my All right. Uh, well, I won't waste a whole lot of time on that. Um, you know, just a real quick background on uh, on uh, Holmes Murphy. Uh, we're your broker, and so what that means is we're not the underwriter. Um, you know, we don't work for the insurance company. Uh, we work for Phi Gamma Delta uh, to find the best coverage at the best uh, prices uh, possible. You know, we're constantly trying to look at the market and and where it is. And it's you know it's uh, you know as of late too, it's been a really uh, challenging challenging job, but we've worked with Phi Gamma Delta since 1991. I myself have worked with Holmes Murphy since uh, 2002 and have worked with, uh, um, you know, Phi Gamma Delta since that, uh, since I came on. Um, in our property program, we have over 2,300 uh, locations, uh, which would be fraternity, uh, fraternity and sorority chapter houses, as well as uh, some student apartment complexes, um, and, uh, and and that represents about four point two billion dollars in insured values uh, with the under that program. Um, based in Omaha, Nebraska, so set and waiting for a uh, ice and snowstorm to come in in a couple hours. So hopefully uh, you're in a, a little better weather than I am. But uh, we are we are based in Omaha. It's a team of twenty four uh, teammates that uh, I work with. Uh, that is 100% uh, dedicated to serving the fraternal market. And, um, you know, for Cerny Sorority and, and other type of student organizations, we place over $45 million annually in written premium. Um, you know, so kind of going back to, uh, you know, talking about prevention, you know, I really want to focus on the general liability or liability coverage and what kind of claims we see there as well as property, because these are two areas, and then really drill down um, you know, into those areas where we, you know, you, we believe that a, a, a well-functioning house corporation can, can have a significant impact in helping, again, either prevent those losses or, um, 
Oh, are, do you guys see my, do you guys see my slide? I think uh, somebody said they were not. You see the slides? Okay, great, great. Um, so, you know, and then, so where are, you know, where, where can you guys have a, an impact? And so the charts that I have up here is, uh, you know, for all of our fraternal clients over, um, you know, um, you know, since back to dating back to 1998 and, you know, looking at in two buckets, what's the frequency and what's the severity frequency being, you know, how, the number of the pure number of claims reported regardless of cost. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, you know, you're looking at our leading um, cause of loss is assault and battery. So, you know, fights that the young men find themselves in, um, you know, during their functions, uh, sexual assault. And, you know, we're, you know, if we look back, you know, five, 10 years ago, um, you know, we're seeing not only that exposure um, grow in terms of frequency of reported claims, but also severity where we're seeing uh, more sexual assault claims, um, you know, pursued ci civilly against chapters, house corporations, and individual members. But then you end there, you have slip and fall um, and fall from heights. And then when we look at severity, that's, that's you know, what are these claims cost? And, and then it start, that starts to change, you know, based upon, you know, what it looks, you know, what, where, where that, how impactful those cause of losses can be in regards to severity injury and the, in, in the amount of litigation that we see from it and the complexity of that litigation uh, relative to defending the organization. And, you know, now what we're seeing is the leading cause is auto accidents. Um, but a big one, you know, that I think you guys have a direct impact on is the fall from heights. Uh, it is a very problematic exposure uh, for fraternity men, uh, especially those that occupy, you know, live in or, you know, are associated with a, with a chapter that has some form of housing. And the other one, while it doesn't show up in the severity, um, is slip and falls. Um, you know, just the condition of our, pre uh, our premises for, you know, both our guests as well as our members and our tenants. So, you know, where are the drivers of the loss? And when we're, when we're talking about in this slide is really when we look at, you know, the millions of dollars paid out over those, you know, 20 plus years, you know, how much is it attributable to uh, housing where it, occur it occurred, you know, the cost of that claim or that claim occurred at a, at a chapter occupying some form of housing. And 85% of our incurred losses are driven by house chapters versus non-house chapters. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, you know, obviously some explanation for that. I, you know, in most cases, our house chapters are probably our larger chapters but they're also going to be our more uh, social, uh, you know, chapters, and then it also just adds in that element of uh, exposure to risk that a non-house chapter doesn't have, and that's that's the that's the premises, you know, those things that house corporations can be found liable for uh, because of the condition of that of that premise. And I know when we kind of look at the cause of losses, everybody it's like, well, where's the alcohol? And certainly we have alcohol poisoning. But when we look at cause of losses, you know, we look at what is the primary contributing factor. So if somebody's provided alcohol but is involved in an auto, you know, and is drunk and involved in an auto accident claim, we're going to classify that as an auto accident. But the secondary contributing factor is going to be uh, the role that alcohol played in that claim. And, and uh, probably to nobody's surprise, 90% of the claims that are, are filed against a fraternity, uh, alcohol some plays a pretty prominent role in the cause of that claim. And so when we look at, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, trying to, you know, mitigate the risk, reduce the risk, you know, it's, it's important to kind of know where our claims are coming from. And, and when we look at the types of fall from heights, because what I will tell you is that these are, these are very impactful uh, in that typically the injuries are very catastrophic, whether that's, you know, quadriplegic, paraplegic, you know, se severe, severe head trauma, um, you know, brain injuries, you know, these, you know, when, when we fall a couple stories, um, you know, the results are, are very, very impactful. So, um, you know, understanding kind of where can we have an impact, it starts with, you know, where are these things happening? And, 
you know, this is just a chart that kind of shows you, you know, with, with the significant uh, fall from heights claims, kind of where they're co coming from, you know, and obviously, you know, roof, window, balcony, and fire escapes are, are, are and even beds um, are places to where, you know, we're seeing significant uh, injuries as a result of falls. You know, so what can we do, you know, what can a house corporation do in regards to mit mitigating this, uh, this risk, uh, you know, fall from heights? Because this, you know, it's probably if you, if, if you have a claim filed against you where you have significant exposure, uh, this is going to be where, you know, probably the bucket that a house corporation should be most concerned about. You know, and the first step, I think, is always going to be, you know, be aware of, of, of your chapter home and the, and the signs of, you know, where there might be uh, people getting on the roofs, um, you know, communicate the expectations around, you know, trying to keep people off fire escapes, keep people off roofs, um, and, um, you know, enforce those expectations. That's a really important part of it. But, uh, you know, what, where we see a lot of these falls happen, you know, the, you know, we have decks where, um, you know, where the liability is, is the railing is in poor condition. Uh, it doesn't meet code. Um, you know, so, you know, we have, you know, those are steps that you want to take. Make sure your railing's in good shape. I mean, those make, you know, take annual inspections. You know, make sure that, uh, um, you know, that not only is it in good shape, but it, that it, you know, it meets your building codes. Uh, obviously, we just dis, uh, discourage any type of railing that encourages kids to set on it. Um, you know, to where that's where we see falls where they just fall backwards sitting on a railing of a deck. And, you know, I think consideration has to be given to, you know, when we do have social functions at our chapter house, is that, a, you know, do we want to limit access to that, the, to the deck space if, if it exists at the chapter facilities? Um, you know, fire escapes is another place, um, you know, many times on many facilities, these are being used just as another uh, entrance into the into the facility when they're you know really designated to be just that an emergency exit in the case of a of a fire. But what we're seeing is obviously kids go out there to to um, smoke. Um, you know we've dealt with a number where they've been puking over the railing of a fire escape and fell over. So uh, you know and 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 the makeout sessions many times happen there. And you know one of our biggest claims was from from that where two you know a guy and a girl went out on the deck and. And um, you know the deck, uh, the deck railing gave way and severely injured the the, the lady. Um, but loft beds as well. Um, you know, if you're allowing lofting um, in your facility, uh, we would highly recommend that you also require bed rails. Um, you know, we do get a lot of kids that uh, fall out of uh, out of out of uh, loft beds. Um, you know. Dylan Hernandez, which is a, a, a case that uh, we're dealing with right now out of San Diego State, was as a result of, a, a, of him falling out of a loft bed and, and sustaining a tra traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, that wasn't at one of our chapter homes. Uh, it was actually a university um, owned um, a university dorm. But, uh, you know, we do see a lot of this where, you know, kids are falling out of beds. Um, so, you know, just make sure, too, that you're following code when those are allowed um, inside your facilities. Um, and again, you know, the bed rail is a, is a big um, mitigator to that exposure of them coming out of those. But uh, roofs are also a, a very significant area. I mean, you saw on the, on the you know, just the pure, pure count of claims, it was one of the leaders, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, young men, um, you know, seem to, um, when they become intoxicated, uh, you know, want to climb up to a high spot, you know, many times they're up there, you know, wanting to watch the sunrise and, um, you know, somebody loses their footing and falls off. But, uh, you know, many of these things you're probably aware of, and it just is, is an issue that it needs to be addressed. I mean, we, when we're out there doing our inspections, let's make sure that we're looking, you know, for those signs that people are either getting on ledges or getting on roofs. Um, and then, um, you know, if you do have a flat roof or a way a roof can be accessed, you know, interior, you know, from the interior of the building, you know, just make sure that that door's locked and, uh, you know, not everybody has access to the key to keep, uh, keep kids off, you know, keep the young men off those, uh, off those roofs. And then uh, obviously windows. I mean, we see a number of people where they've just, uh, you know, fallen out of windows, you know, in the middle of the night. And, and a lot of times what we're seeing in those situations is to where they've moved their bed 
you know, next to the window, screens are out of the window, um, you know, so what can we do to, you know, try to address that, you know, obviously don't allow beds next to windows, um, you know, make sure that our screens are in place. I mean, and, and if without, um, you know, messing, you know, creating issues with um, the ability to get out of the, you know, emergency exits, um, you know, if you go into a hotel room, those windows don't open up all the way, you know, there's like, if, if at anything, they open up a crack, crack. So, you know, is that something that we can do to, uh, you know, you know, keep people inside the facilities and not outside the facilities. Uh, you know, the largest, one of the largest claims that I'm aware of um, against the House Corporation was a result of a fall um, from heights at uh, UCLA. A young lady uh, had come over, um, and it was in the morning um, at the chat, another fraternity's chapter house. Uh, some of the guys were setting out on the ledge. Um, on the other side of a balcony, she uh, had elected to in, in join them. There was a bit of a little jump that you had to get to get to the ledge. It was three stories up. She fell to the ground. And, um, you know, as much as that sounds like that, that's her fault. Um, you know, what was the um, issue against the House Corporation ultimately was that they were aware uh, that the young men were going and uh, setting on that, on that ledge. And they hadn't taken any precautions uh, or steps necessary to prevent them from getting out on the ledge. And, uh, you know, subsequent to the loss, which can't be, a, is not admissible evidence, they did uh, make modifications that uh, didn't allow the young, you know, would, you know they, then they, they can, they've removed the act, the ability to set on that ledge. So again, that's just the awareness, um, you know, let's not wait for what we know is going on to become an issue because then it makes it much easier uh, you know, for the plaintiff attorneys to establish negligence against the House Corporation. And again, these are very significant um, losses uh, as far as it uh, goes uh, for fraternities. I mean, these are, these are um, very expensive losses. Um, so then the next piece of it is mitigating the risks of slips and falls. Uh, you know, I, you know, again, it's an awareness thing. They're not, you know, we don't, these, uh, we, we don't have huge claims relative to these, but uh, it is something to where, you know, if we're taking the right steps, we can, uh, you know, we can help mitigate those exposures, but, um, you know, exterior, you know, make sure that our sidewalks are clear, uh, free of hazards, um, you know, open and obvious hazards, we're going to be, um, you know, accountable to our guests to make them aware of that or correct those. And then, um, you know, clean up spills immediately. Some of these things we have to coach our chapters on. If we're having social functions inside of our facilities, you know, there's probably likely substance being spilled. You know, we need to be, um, we need to be on top of that while we're going through our, you know, where we're having our, our, um, our functions and activities to make sure that those, uh, you know, anything that's slipped uh, is uh, spilled is cleaned up uh, promptly. You know, post warning signs and alerts um, but, uh, you know, and then the in, egress and ingress, you know, lighting's a big thing, you know, make sure that we have the appropriate lighting. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're recognizing or warning of hazards, uh, and then just paying attention to where, you know, maybe we do have social functions. Do we have, uh, the right type of flooring? Uh, you know, would it, would it be beneficial to have slip type, uh, slip resistant flooring in some of those areas? Um, the last thing I, I um, you know, I, I said I have to address because it is a significant issue, um, you know, involving uh, Phi Gamma Delta, you know, two of our largest claims uh, in the history of the organization were a result of a slip and slide, uh, as well as the, uh, as the pool features that sometimes the water features that get built uh, in conjunction with the Islander parties. Um, I know this is an issue that the fraternity uh, hammers on and rightfully so because it's, uh, uh, again, you know, we've, uh, we've had some pretty, pretty significant claims. University of Kansas um, was one to where we had uh, an Islander party um, and a young man decided to uh, dive into the, into the um, shallow pool that they had built uh, with sandbags and a tarp and uh, broke his neck um, and was, uh, was a paraplegic. Um, you know, it's, those are tough cases. I mean, the uh, hard special values of them are significant. The life care is significant. 
um, and the plaintiffs are very sympathetic, uh, even though you know it's it's situations where I think largely their own negligence caused that uh, you know caused their injuries. Uh, the other one was uh, you know just a non-alcoholic event involving a slip and slide, uh, but you know we had a ramp built and uh, you know somebody. Uh, um, the first person that went down the ramp, the, the, uh, I guess the launch angles weren't calculated right and, um, you know, hit the edge of that uh, pool. And that's an actual uh, picture of the, of the slip and slide and, um, you know, broke their neck on that. And uh, that was actually a case that, uh, that we tried in front of a jury and um, the jury did not like, uh, did not like it and, uh, uh, you know, returned a verdict of $8 million with only 10% negligence on the on the kid that uh, assumed the risk. I mean, he had actually helped build the, build the slip and slide and the ramp, um, but they only found him to be 10% negligent. So it just kind of shows you how difficult these losses can be to, to defend. Um, property claims. Um, so when you look at that, I mean, you know, we're, we're really, you know, battling, which I think is, you know, areas that you, you know, we as, um, managers, um, owners of these facilities can have uh, an impact on is obviously the water damage and fire and, and vandalism. But those are those are the three things from a frequency standpoint that, uh, you know, really stand out um, you know, from a severity standpoint. 57% uh, of, uh, of all of our claims uh, dollars paid uh, are a result of some form of water damage. And we'll get a little bit more into that. I do like this chart because if I would have went back 10 years ago, that fire, um, the piece of the, the piece of the pie that's related to fire, which is still 14%, uh, would have been much larger. Now, when we update our claim statistics, it's going to be uh, probably go back quite up uh, quite significantly because we had a, um, you know, very significant total loss fire at the University of, uh, of Oklahoma, not a Phi Gamma Delta. Uh, property, but uh, it was something that ultimately had to be brought to the ground. And then wind and hail, and, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, you just really can't, you can't control. They're acts of God, um, you know, certainly maybe around what, you know, what are um, trees and, and um, you know, fixtures outside that may, and you know, increase the, uh, the damage associated with a wind event. You know, there are steps that we can do, make sure that we don't have a tr tree that uh, poses an imminent, imminent danger to the property. Should we have a you know a thunderstorm come through, that um, you know we could have avoided that. But uh, you know, fire and the fire and water damage are really where uh, you know if we focus our our efforts in regards to uh, you know preventing and mitigating losses, we can have a, a significant uh, impact on on cost of claims and and ultimately um, the cost of our insurance coverage. But uh, you know, again, fit, you know. 57% of the dollars paid out in claims is associated with, with water damage. And uh, when we looked at the frequency, you know, 211 of those are associated with freeze losses um, and 380 with fixture overflows. Um, and then you have your, you know, sewer backups and, and uh, sprinkler malfunctions. Certainly, um, you know, the reason we're seeing the decrease in the fires because more of our facilities are installing uh, fire sprinkler systems, you know, whether, you know, whether that be when we do a major renovation or our municipality mandates that, uh, that those improvements be made. But, uh, you know, more and more of our facilities are now being protected by those water you know, fire sprinklers. So while our, our, our exposure uh, is getting reduced with fire, obviously with that, uh, all that water inside of our facilities, the, the risk of that water damage grows. Um, you know, we're a big proponent of uh, leak detection systems. Uh, we offer a, a pretty robust uh, um, discount of 20% for the first two years after inst installation of a leak detection system, and then 5% thereafter um, um, for, for the installation of the system. But when we look at it, obviously not all of our water losses can be can be uh, impacted by by um, you know a leak detect system. We use we recommend Pipe Burst Pro. They've been somebody that's been um, uh, pretty uh, uh, involved in the fraternity space. Um, you know you know trying to help install these products. You know and, and in most cases the cost of the installation 
you know, is, you know, is going to, in, in parts, is going to range somewhere between three to $6,000. You certainly can spend more uh, because they do have these water bugs that they put around, you know, where there's sources of water that if they um, detect, you know, so you could have them around your washers, uh, your, you know, your clothes washers or your dishwashers. And when they, when they would uh, sense water, then they would shut the water source off at that appliance. Um, but the, but they do, I mean, this is, this is a huge opportunity for us. I mean, I think it's as impactful as fire sprinklers has been, have been for, for the reduction in the, uh, the loss caused by, by fires. And especially when we're, um, when we're, when we're out of school on these extended breaks and maybe we don't have somebody, um, walking through the facility on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, this will allow us to, you know, to be kind of have our hands on, you know, in on the facility and and monitoring the facility without actually physically being there. Because if it if it senses senses something that where there's an unusual amount of water being used based upon the range you set, it will automatically shut the water source off at the main valve, uh, the main line, um, and then you know, it gives you time to send somebody out to check on what's going on because. What we see, some of these freeze losses, and obviously you can see, you can see plumbing failure and freeze losses. Um, you know, when we kind of, uh, um, you know, look at uh, look at those, the you know, the problems that we have over break, where we don't have people consistently inside those facilities, um, the um, the uh, the loss tends to grow. Something that could be very minor and small um, is now, um, you know. A, a, you know, I, I, we've had over one, you know, million dollar water losses, you know, unfortunately, it seems like in the larger facilities, the water line that always breaks is on the top floor. Um, but, you know, the, the, the contributing factor is maybe the water ran, um, you know, for, for 24, 36 hours. I mean, we've literally had um, um, somebody being notified by, um, you know, their house was close to the, to the um, bus route and uh, somebody sitting at the bus noticed that there was water coming outside uh, outside the front door down the front steps and uh, for whatever reason the facility was under a uh, you know, contract to be sold so the lady called the the real estate agent and advised it and advised them of that and I mean we estimate that water inside that facility may have ran for for well over a week so uh, a lot of opportunity there uh, with the uh, with the leak detection systems, but uh, you know, just some solutions around this is obviously regular inspections. Um, you know, if you see something where we have maybe an ongoing leak, you know, making sure that we're addressing that because those can tend to be uh, become bigger. Um, and then you also, if something ha you know goes on for over fourteen days, uh, you know, becomes a maintenance issue, and you potentially have issues uh, with insurance coverage for that. But um, you know, heat monitoring is a big thing. I know, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people believe that uh, the that's a northern uh, states kind of issue, you know, the freeze losses. But really, I mean, some of our largest freeze losses have been south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, you know, kids go away, they don't turn the heat on. Um, you know, then you get some of these deep cold snaps that go, you know, into the deep, you know, into, into the southern states. Um, and we do, our facilities just aren't protected. Um, you know, also, you know, just, you know, simple things like, um, you know, not repairing windows or leaving windows open, you know, impact the, uh, the ability to, to heat the facility. So if we, again, if we, you know, a lot of these leak detection systems also have these, uh, you know, these monitoring systems that monitor the heat, uh, you know, and if we can see that our heat, you know, we don't have appropriate heat in there, we're losing heat inside the facility, you know, again, we're not inside the facility, but it's responding to our phone. We're able to uh, we're able to get out there and get on top of that before it becomes a, a huge problem. But the other thing with the um, the sprinkler heads, the kids seem to have a you know be very uh, good in a wide variety of ways of breaking sprinkler heads. And and um, you know when water comes out of one of those sprinkler heads, it's a lot of water. It doesn't have to run very long uh, for it to become a significant claim, but, you know, what, what's happening is footballs being thrown inside the facility. We've had, you know, somebody shoot one out with a paintball gun, um, you know, hanging clothes, uh, from them inside the rooms. Maybe they're in a, in a spot that just creates a more higher risk, uh, for them to be, be hit, you know, they're, you know, right over the, the loft bed or whatever it may be. Um, you know, we're making a big push in regards to, 
you've seen the cages if you know if if your if your sprinkler heads are exposed there are caves cages that you can install um, that will protect those you know from that what you know that softball you know some of those some of those minor things that are that are breaking these systems um, you know obviously if you're going um, if you're putting a new system in you know even looking at recessing those they obviously look um, it looks a lot better um, but it's also you know it's also going to be a, a system that's going to be less prone to, to having a big a big water loss as a result of one of those one of those heads breaking when we look at fire um, you know electrical mechanical and smoking and uh, arson are some of the bigger uh, uh, exposures to those risks that uh, you know are driving the the fire losses you know and then when we look at what's the average incurred loss i mean fire is a very expensive uh you know type of of loss even if it's a small fire uh the way it you know smoke can impact and, and require cleanup and the contents that are damaged but you know on average just under four hundred thousand dollars is the average cost of electrical fire um and then obviously uh intentional acts you know that's going to range from kids shooting off fireworks inside the facility um you know the uh um, and various things like that, but uh, very expensive. So, you know, what can you do here? You know, just make sure that, uh, you know, your electrical capacity is sufficient for the facility. I mean, this is becoming, you know, a big deal because kids come with so many le more electronics um, that, uh, you know, you know, a lot of, if, if your facility hasn't had its electrical updated in a while, it's probably uh, insufficient for the amount of usage that you're seeing from the tenants. Um, you know, obviously signs that uh, you don't have enough receptacles is, you know, drop cords running all over the place because those are, you know, places where they become frayed and they cause the fire. Um, but, uh, you know, big, big opportunity there, you know, for, you know, for the house corporations to, to have an impact. You know, and then on the arson piece, a lot of times that arson is, um, you know, somebody that, uh, you know, has uh, seen an opportunity based upon where we you know, we've we've had a house deck and there's a bunch of lumber associated with it. And where do we store it? We store it right up next to the chapter house. And uh, and, uh, you know, an arsonist comes and sees that as an opportunity to to start that on fire. So, you know, just the the, the, the debris and, and the stuff around the house, you know, when, you know, obviously, too, where do where are our, um, our um, grills and other things? Um, you know, safely a safe distance around the you know, away from the house, and then the mechanical systems uh, inside the house. And I think I, I do believe that the smoking issue is becoming less and less. Um, I think less young people smoke, but you know, certainly we um, really um, are big proponents of no smoking policies inside the facilities. And I mean, I, I don't know, you probably in most municipalities, you know, based upon the the um, the um, the common, you know boarding house type of situation is probably not allowed, but then uh, no candles as well. Um, you know, we see a lot of those fires, you know, start from the, the candles. Um, you know, we're getting close here. And then there's really the fire solutions, you know, the smoking and candles. I think we all kind of hit on those, and you know, through that uh, initial discussion. But, uh, you know, kind of when we just look at, you know, kind of going back to to winter versus, uh, you know, uh, non, you know, when these breaks versus non breaks, you know, obviously the losses are much larger, even though maybe the frequency uh, is equal uh, when we're out on break um, versus when we're in these facilities. And, and I know with COVID, this has become a bigger, bigger issue, but uh, then summer and winter break versus non winter break for fires, you know, substantially larger when we're away from break versus when, when we're there. I mean, I think this comes is logical based upon the response time. And one thing I added, and I know I'm r running close out of time, but I was uh, sitting and uh, watching the early morning news for the local, our local station. They had a, a story on there about uh, the uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation of Iowa C CEO had embezzled, uh, you know, from the organization. And it's, uh, it's a big issue that house corporations are confronted with, you know, and, uh, um, you know, we, you, you would be surprised at how many embezzlement cases, you know, happen at the house court level. And, uh, um, you know, so I just wanted to, you know, kind of point out some simple, simple steps to mitigate this exposure, um, you know, because a lot of times the insurance coverage, 
uh, that there is for the financial crime is insufficient. Um, you know, four hundred thousand dollars is is stolen, and but only, there's only five hundred or fifty thousand dollars, you know, worth of embezzlement coverage. So, um, you know, the, none of these things will eliminate the possibility of embezzlement claim, but it certainly will mitigate it, and it will certainly um, create a situation where you will detect it much quicker. But you know, making sure that our our duties are segregated, you know, for payables and receivables. Uh, that whoever's the bill payer is not, you know, it, uh, is not the reconciler of the account, that we're doing monthly rec reconciliations of the account. So if there are any irregularities, you know, we detect that quickly. Um, you know, keep current too. Who has the authority to sign? Make sure that that list uh, is current. And then with our online passwords, when we have officers transition out that are our financial officers, make sure that we're changing and updating those passwords. Um, you know, dual signatures or at least approval on checks over a certain threshold. Um, and then, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're starting to see more and more to where you're seeing these phishing schemes, um, these social engineering types of losses to where there's fraudulent wire transfers that's initiated through an email that looks legitimate, you know, and the kind of how do we, what do we do to mitigate that is, you know, you got to have a process to where before you complete a wire transfer that there's at least phone, a phone confirmation, um, you know, to that receiving party, um, as well as, uh, um, you know, confirmation of the wire instructions. Um, COVID-19, um, you know, obviously that's a new exposure that you're all dealing with. Um, you know, my recommendation there is that, uh, you know, just we got to we got to live up to a, a you know a reasonable standard. Uh, you know, we're I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody to hold uh, a house corporation responsible for COVID, uh, a COVID related claim. You know, based upon how difficult it is going to prove to where where the, the case you know where it's contracted at. But uh, you know, you got to encourage these guys to make sure that we're not um, you know violating whatever the local uh, requirements are in regards to how many people outside people can be at the facility. You know, the cleaning protocols are, are in place that at least meet a minimum, you know, a reasonable standard, um, you know, because there is going to be insurance coverage issues on, on the next renewal relative to this. Insurance carriers are putting, um, you know, uh, virus exclusions on these policies in response to this. Um, you know, what I can say is, as of right now, we have not had uh, one claim brought against a house corporation relative to COVID, um, but we still have, our, we still are seeing um, other claims. Rob had uh, provided this in regards to the other types of claims that we've seen, um, you know, since we've kind of been in this COVID uh, lockdown. So, um, you know, there was a lot of, of, of energy around reducing this risk. Uh, right out of the gate, and I think that's great. Um, but my encouragement is, is like our every our everyday problems are continuing to occur, and we need to be committing that energy um, as equally into these things that we deal with on a day to day basis: the alcohol issues, the fall from heights, the sexual assault, those types of things, because that's that's where we're going to um, either succeed or fail. I I really don't COVID. As, as, a, as, as something that's going to be, end up being a huge significant exposure for a fraternity or a housing corporation. Um, that is uh, my, uh, my presentation. I would open it up to uh, any questions. I know I try to cover uh, a lot of things very quickly, but we do have uh, a couple questions. Uh, one was from um, Brett Cooper. Does the benefit of sprinkler outweigh the da that that uh, water damage risk? And I would say absolutely yes. Um, you know, on average, um, you know, when a sprinkler head breaks, we're going to be dealing with you know something you know maybe a fifty thousand dollar water loss versus uh, the cost of that fire. Should uh, it would it not have been uh, um, extinguished immediately? So, and it's there's huge premium savings for. Uh, sprinkled facilities versus non-sprinkled facilities in our insurance programs. So, uh, if you're on the fence about whether you get whether you want to install a system or not, uh, I will tell you that uh, you would save a substantial amount on your insurance premiums. Uh, 
I know I'm eating into your break. Um, how much true ex oh, how much true exposure does a chapter have without a without housing a property? Uh, you know, you know, I mean, that's kind of one of the uh, the uh, ever ending debates with probably uh, a, a fraternity office deals with when they have a with a non housed chapter. I mean, there's still obviously risk. Uh, they're associated with their events and activities. Um, you know, we're, they're going to uh, third party locations for a lot of their, a lot of their events, but uh, it is, it is, it is a lesser risk than where we do have a, a chapter house, you know, what's that, what's the right uh, differential, um, you know, that, uh, you know, obviously the money, uh, the, where the money flows certainly uh, leads you to the think that it's, that it's fairly significant, but to feel like that they don't have exposure is uh, is um, is not uh, is not realistic either. We lease another fraternity's chapter house that was booted off campus. What type? Uh, what kind of coverage do we need, um, Jeff? What I would ask for you to do is to email if you have your lease, email that to me. And a, a couple things: Do you want to verify what insurance coverage they have? Um, and then also just, you know, we need to make sure what, uh, uh, what, what, what you've assumed under that contract relative to insurance requirements uh, for liability as well as uh, protecting the, the chapter house. Uh, my email address is um, first initial last name, which is R-J-U-N-G-M-A-N at homesmurphy.com. But we'd be happy to look at that lease for you and uh, and uh, make sure that you've got all your bases covered. Any other questions? All right, well, I do, again, thank you for your uh, service uh, to the House Corporation and making, you know, helping, uh, you know, play a part in, uh, can, you know, making that fraternity experience a positive one. I think housing plays a critical role on, on a number of campuses and, uh, you know, it's something that we want to see, um, you know, the future generations be able to, uh, to experience just like we did. Thank you, guys everyone and, and thank you rich really appreciate it um everyone the next session starts at 1 45 but if you'd like to go ahead and go into the waiting room for your next session feel free um i'll go ahead and drop the agenda just one more time in the chat so everyone has access to that